Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Barker, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Judy Cornish. Uh, Judy is an author, the founder of Dementia and Alzheimer's Wellbeing Network, Dawn. She's the creator of the Dawn Method of Dementia Care and a retired elder law attorney. Her two books, The Dementia Handbook and Dementia with Dignity, take person-centered dementia care from theory to practice by identifying the skills not lost to dementia. Through Dawn, Cornish provides <clears throat> online training programs for families and professional caregivers, as well as certification courses for agencies and facilities. Dawn Cornish's life life's work has been making dignified dementia care and aging in place available for all. Uh, Dawn, thank you. Dawn, yeah, Dawn <laughs> Judy, I am so sorry. I was reading oh, that and I was like, wait a minute, I thought the Dawn method. Okay, well, I'm sure the audience will get a kick out of that. Judy. No, you cannot <laughs> worry about it. I, my mother and my husband never make an error. They always call me Judy. Everybody else calls me Dawn at least half the time. So is that true? I, yeah, the and Dawn I kind method, of, they just assume Dawn. Dawn the Dawn yeah. method. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well, no worries. You. Thank you for being my guest. And I think that this is the first time I've um, I've talked to anybody where they're really discussing what people don't lose when they have dementia. So could yeah. you share a little bit more about yourself, um, your two books and the Dawn Method? Well, I'll, maybe I should say where, where how I became involved with dementia because it is a little odd. Um, I'm, you know, my career is law and um, I don't have anybody in my family who's experiencing dementia. So most of us, most of us don't choose to get involved with dementia. We, we are forced into it through loving somebody, a family member who's experiencing it. But for me, um, I had moved to this little town, Moscow, Idaho, and in hopes of having a quiet, uh, semi-retired, uh, a life of gardening and skiing, and practicing a little bit of elder law <laughs> on the side uh, back in 2010. And okay. um, as I was getting to know people and talking to lawyers to you know, see what kind of law was really needed, uh, one of my neighbors, and, and she was great. I was just getting to know her and she was mid sixties and great sense of humor. We got you know acquainted over her tomatoes in the front yard and <laughs> she was pretty forgetful. And then one night her daughter dropped by and said, well, we're going to have to sell the house and put mom in a care facility because she keeps losing the car. And, you know, I'm, I'm now in my mid 60s and I knowing this lovely person, I just couldn't imagine her uh, put away, locked up. Right, leaving, leaving her, her home. home, leaving her oh. tomato plants. Well, 56 years in the same home, I think, at that point. And wow. So I said, well, hey, you know, um, I buy groceries. I, I, I go, I run errands. I'll, I'll, she can, I'll do it with her. <laughs> Don't make her move. You know, just let me help. And it wasn't, it was just a few weeks before I, the phone would ring and somebody would say, hey, is this Judy Cornish? Well, good, because I hear you're looking after so-and-so's mom. My dad is pretty forgetful. He lives there in Moscow. Can you check in on him? Oh, and so that's how Dawn began. And Dawn is an acronym. You know, it's not a person's name. It's it's <laughs> dementia and Alzheimer's well-being network. And I picked it because I, you know, even then, just a couple of months in, um, of course, by the time I was looking after half a dozen seniors living at home alone and a little forgetful, I didn't have time to practice law. But even then, I could see that although I knew nothing about dementia, and I wasn't a nurse or a social worker or um, even a certified nurse's aide, nothing medical in my background, but I could see that it wasn't terrible. That there there was something there that um, I you know I'd only ever heard that that dementia meant people went crazy, they lost their memories and they went and they just became. You know, the, the behaviors, the strange things people would do. And all you can do is just give them psychotropic drugs and, you know, put them in a care facility and lock the doors. So they don't. But it doesn't them. have to be like that. 
It doesn't. You know, there are the extreme circumstances, but you know, if, if the family members or the caregivers can be trained appropriately, the yeah. experience yeah. does not have to be um, so so dramatic. So and so and painful so for painful. everybody. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that that's beautiful how it just started out with you wanting to do um, something kind yeah, for your neighbor yeah. and then it organically grew from there. That That's beautiful. It, it, so, yeah, it did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Don, uh, let's talk about dementia, some basic things. How prevalent is dementia? You know, worldwide. I think we're getting an echo. I don't know if... It, if that's bothering our, our listeners. I, nobody has said something and I'm not hearing it um, on my end. Your voice is fine, but I'm getting a terrible echo, but I'll ignore it as long as everybody else is all right. But, okay. you know, worldwide, we're talking about uh, 50 million people are experiencing dementia million. worldwide. And that's the incidence is about 10 million people a year. If you're looking at the United States, the, the Alzheimer's Association provides um, good statistics. Um, they're saying that like in 2020, we had somewhere between five and six million new cases of Alzheimer's in the United States. They also said that, say that Alzheimer's represents about 60, maybe 70% of the dementia, dementias that we have. So, okay. you know, what we're really looking at is about 8.3 million people last year developed dementia. Okay. So this is an epidemic. It's just not it what it is. <clears throat> and let's, before we, before we move into discussing the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's, right? Um, can we talk a little bit about how, you know, years and years ago, were there as many people that, that had these cognitive impairments and they just didn't quite know what to call it? Um, or they just thought, oh, gram grandma's just losing her mind, right? Or has there actually been an increase in this type of disease? There's a lot of people studying this and a lot of opinions, but what's come out, what we are beginning to realize is that um, what we used to call senility is not a normal part of aging. And even 12 years ago, we had, um, it was being taught in medical schools that dementia was just a normal part of aging. And now we know it is not. Um, oh. However, you know, dementia is, it's not a disease. It's, 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 um, it's not synonymous with Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is one of the diseases that do cause dementia. But there's okay. many others. And so, um, you know, Parkinson, Lewy body, um, yeah. cardiovascular disease. But then not only diseases can cause dementia, also events can cause dementia. So, you know, some people will go through chemo and develop chemo, what we call chemo brain, and they never come out of it. And that is uh, chemo-induced dementia. Sometimes a person okay. who experiences a traumatic brain injury earlier in life will mm -hmm. develop dementia and, and TBIs, traumatic brain injury, does increase mm -hmm. the likelihood that you experience dementia. Okay, could you explain, um, so there there are all these different types of dementia, right? The Lewy bodies, yeah. uh, Parkinson's associated, vascular, um, yeah. alcohol, yeah. alcohol-induced dementia. Korsakoff syndrome, yep, that's right. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle uh, has a big impact. And, and that, and that's, now, I'm sure we'll, mm -hmm. yeah. so what, uh, so you explained a little bit about it, but but could you get specific about what really is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's is a disease and it has um, markers. It has causes. You know, it, okay. you can identify what's happening in the brain um, as a result of the person experiencing Alzheimer's disease. But dementia is a syndrome or a condition like COPD is a syndrome or a condition. So you can't cure dementia because you can't, um, unlike a disease, you can't target the markers and, and come up with a treatment that will cure it. So, you know, a tremendous amount of time and effort is going into um, searching for uh, a treatment and a cure for Alzheimer's disease. That we must not be confused and think that curing Alzheimer's will cure dementia. 
And in my own experience, I, I know they say about 60 to 70 percent of the all, of, of the dementia cases are caused by Alzheimer's. But uh, that wasn't my experience in Moscow, Idaho, and it's not my experience when I'm consulting with families nationwide. It's a much lower incidence than I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot more cardiovascular disease. And then I'm seeing these mixed dementias that really are the result of a person's lifestyle choices earlier in life. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> nutritional choices, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lack of sedentary lifestyle, uh, processed meats. Um, you know, there mm -hmm. are markers. There are, are things that we eat and things that we do that cause us to experience dementia later in life due to the tax that it takes on our brains. And our so, brain mm -hmm. I, I've heard people say before, and I and I thought, okay, well, that makes sense. Well, the reason why we have such an increase in, in dementias now is because people are living longer uh, because of our evolution in, in um, healthcare, right? The technologies that keep people alive, the, the treatments. Now, I mean, how much is there to that? Is that true? Um, but I'm also hearing the lifestyle changes and, and how lifestyle changes have, have tended to become more sedentary over the years too. So is it a combination of living longer and lifestyle? There's definitely factors, you know, that are, that are having an effect, but um, yes, because we live longer, you're going to see more people develop dementia because they're alive um, later in life. But dementia does not, is not uh, strictly associated with aging. Um, there's quite a prevalence um, in Australia right now. We're seeing a lot of uh, childhood dementia. What? And, um, you know, myself, the youngest person I've dealt with who, who developed dementia was, she developed it when she was 31 years old. So this is not something that's associated with aging. It's just that. Um, I think the more accurate way to talk about the prevalence of dementia would be to say that the longer you live, the better chance you have of having long-term detrimental effects from your lifestyle choices on your brain matter. That's, wow, that's very concise. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I think that the message that the audience needs to get right now is, hey, take a look at the, the lifestyle choices that you're, that you're making. Um, before we move into talking about the, the different approaches to caring with somebody with dementia, what are the things that you have to say about lifestyle? What should people be avoiding? And then what should they be doing more of? Okay, get out there and exercise. Even if you just go for a walk, <laughs> you're helping yourself. But get your heart rate up. Get yourself, break a sweat. Uh, get your heart pounding. You know, when you feel the blood pounding through your brain, that's got to be helping. <laughs> so that's the first thing. Get out there and get moving. Do something that you enjoy and just be moving. Um, okay. Secondly, don't eat processed food. If, if you know, when you think about this, and this is off topic, I know, but who should be feeding us? Corporations or Mother Earth? What are our bodies designed to run on? Mm -hmm. Processed food or real food? Think about how corporations develop the food they market. They develop it so that it can be shipped mm -hmm. and so that it will last on a shelf so they have a longer shelf life means more profit. Right. That If it's got shelf life and it can survive, you know, being in a semi going across the country, that does not mean that it is good nutrition. It's usually the opposite. True. So eat mm -hmm. real food. Don't let yourself be fed by the corporations that are making money and and want to preserve um, profit rather than nutrition. That makes a lot of sense. Because, mm -hmm. I think about my grandmother, and I think she's eighty five now, but um, lived. She's still up on the family farm. But I mean. Ate, ate the cows there, ate the chickens, ate from the garden, and her mind is so sharp right now. And then I compare her, of course, to the many clients that I've had over the years, and you can see a big difference. And so now that you're talking about the, the diet, I, yeah. I can see how it really uh, creates a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But surely the things, the chemicals that are put into food that make food be inert and last longer, surely those chemicals are affecting the body. 
How could it <laughs> not? Right? Really, yeah. If we're talking about preservatives, it can't be good because our bodies are not designed to absorb and uh, produce energy from from things that are chemical or preservative. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, that would be what I'd say. It's like find something to do that you enjoy doing. Go out, work up a sweat, get your blood moving, and then yep. try to avoid processed food. Okay, uh, that's perfect. That's, that's easy it. enough. Did you yeah. hear that, audience? Move yeah. your body and yeah. eat real food. <laughs> eat real food. Yeah. Okay, so there are two primary um, approaches for caring for those who are experiencing dementia. What are yeah. they? Okay, so there is our traditional classical approach in the United States, um, which is to think of dementia as being synonymous with Alzheimer's disease and then to apply a medical model to that. So, you know, our medical model worked really well. If, um, you know, if you've had an accident, you've got an injury, you, you need to have your injury taken care of so you can be returned to health. Or if you have a disease, um, say cancer, and you want to go to a specialist and have um, and be returned to health. You're looking for a treatment or a cure. So, so the model is identify what is abnormal or unhealthy, and then start running tests. If unless of course it's like an accident, you can see you just need to have that bone set. Um, start running tests so that you can diagnose exactly what's wrong. So if we're if the model is if we're talking about cancer. Um, if I find I've got a lump and I go to a GP and I say, you know, gosh, what is this? And he says, I'd like you to go see the uh, a specialist about that. As soon as I go to the oncologist, I, I want them to focus on what's wrong with me mm-hmm. and run mm-hmm. tests because I want to know exactly what it is. I want to know how far along it is. I want to know all of the possible treatment options. Mm-hmm. Why? Because I've, they've got treatment and I've got a really good chance of being cured of it and not having to live with it or die from it. Mm-hmm. So, so that's our biomedical model. It's, it's um, you know, identify an abnormality, test so you can diagnose, and then select treatment or cure and apply it. And your goal is to change the person back to being healthy. Okay. You know, you put a you, you have a broken green stick fracture, you're going to put a cast on it, or you're going to immobilize it, and you're going to, through immobilization, that's your treatment, and you're going to see the person return to health. So this works very, very well. It's, it's certainly the correct model for uh, disease, for research, mm-hmm. for any time that we have some kind of an abnormality. And we can, through addressing it, bring the person back to health. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why does that not work with dementia? <laughs> because you can't cure a syndrome or you can't cure dementia. There is no treatment. So the same approach doesn't work. So so what, what is working. the right approach? Well, that's what we're applying, though. And, and so here's what's happening currently with dementia is we um, go to the GP and get a diagnosis. Excellent. You really should know whether or not you're experiencing the condition of dementia. But Mm -hmm. now this is a condition and the condition, what happens is people begin to behave differently because they're losing cognitive skills. Now, when when we as humans are losing skills we're used to having, we get upset. We have emotional reactions. I am scared because for the first time in my life, I can't make coffee in my own kitchen. I tell families when I've met with families, you have to understand that if they're if they're still aware, right? There there yeah. comes a point where they're not aware, but there is the time where there's still this awareness, and it can be very scary, and it can d- produce a very strong feeling of insecurity and fear, and of course that's going to manifest in behaviors. Right. Yeah. We we react we react to changes in our skills um, emotionally. Now, mm-hmm. the way we are looking at dementia with that biomedical model is we say, well, there's a ch- we can't see any physical. Now, you know, there's no swelling. There's no broken bone. There's no bleeding. So what are we going to look for? Well, we've got behavior. Okay, we're going to call that dementia-related behavior. Now we've got a whole list of them. Exit-seeking, wandering, uh, restlessness, combative behaviors, sundowning. Well, you know, if you've ever raised children, uh, people all, of all ages... <laughs> 
<laughs> when they are having emotional reactions to situations and things they can or cannot do, they all behave in that way. So these are not behaviors that are specific to dementia. They're behaviors that are specific to human beings who get upset. Who yeah, loss of, lo loss of control, loss of security, a right, feeling, right, a sense of security. Right, right. Yes. So, so what we've done, though, because we have this model, is we've taken normal human emotional reactions and behaviors and turns them into symptoms of disease. Now, now what do you want? You Now you need to cure these. Well, we don't have treatment. We don't have cure. Is and this where the whole thing comes where they're just medicating people? That's the only thing there is. If you want to change a behavior, use a psychotropic drug. And a psychotropic drug does not cure dementia. It simply makes it harder for the person to express their pain, their fear, their anger their sorrow, their grief. You know so, what, Judy? It makes me feel sorry because I, I just had this picture of a of a person when they put them on medications, right, to control the behaviors. I, I just had this picture and feeling of this person being trapped within. Right, trapped in the pain. It, yeah. it doesn't take away, you know, if you give me a psychotropic drug, it doesn't take away my sorrow or my pain or my fear or my terror. It makes it doesn't even touch it. It just traps me with it. Yeah. It's cruelty. And and so what we have though is this model. We we think there is disease, therefore there are symptoms. The symptoms have to be behaviors because there's nothing else. Therefore, we need to use a psychotropic drug to change the behaviors. It's a broken model. It doesn't work. It doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Here's another model. And you know the the funny bit about it. I mean, the thing that just floors me is, you know, think think about children. Children are experiencing changing skills, right? They are actually mm -hmm. developing cognitive skills. But children also, because they are going through a period of change, they're human beings and they have these yes. emotions, these normal human emotions. And so, you know, I raised three boys and, and my goodness, I think they sundowned all three of them every day. <laughs> <laughs> right before dad got home everybody got cranky yeah thinking uh, restlessness combative behavior yeah, <laughs> definitely yeah so, so here we are we've got children how do we raise children we don't go to the doctor and say oh my goodness this this little one here this human this one is two years old and i'm getting these behaviors um, exit seeking, compounded behavior. It, it doesn't like to share and it gets really upset when it needs to share a toy with it. You know, we don't go to a doctor over that. We use child rearing approaches, which is actually an experiential model. When we are raising children, we expect that they're going to have emotional reactions and behaviors that are difficult to deal with. So what do we do? We take into account the child's emotional development, and their cognitive development, and we shape the environment so they are more likely to succeed. Now, the two-year-old, rather than getting taken to the doctor for a psychotropic drug to mute its inability to deal with its changing skills and emotions, we, we prescribe now. Right. So you know, basically, and, and, we need to be, do the same thing in at, at the end. At the reverse, right? Well, why why don't we just apply the same experiential model and compassion? Not, it, it's just you know out of kindness. With when the child is young, we are kind. We accept its emotional reactions and we work. We accept its cognitive development and and the information we share with the two year old is less than the information shared with the twelve year old. We take into account its emotional development and cognitive. Um, condition of the time. We could do the same thing for our elders when they're losing skills rather than gaining them. It's called using an experiential model. We've been, and it's habilitative care. We've been doing this for eons. We've been raising our children this way forever. And that's and, the Dawn method, I'm assuming, yeah, right? So when you're talking about that, that's what the Dawn method incorporates. Yes. And, and please let me say, I am not saying that my elders are like children. It is a completely different situation because the child starts with no skills or you know not even verbal language skills and is growing in skills. And we, we allow children to have childhood and we recognize that childhood is a time for learning 
and playing and growing. And we give them space and we support them. We, we, we create the environment so they will succeed in going through this changing period of development. And we do it with kindness and grace. Then they arrive in, in adulthood. Now the adult is not learning. Well, the adult is still learning and growing, but adulthood is the time for doing, you know, working and mm -hmm. doing and accomplishing and becoming highly skilled, um, gathering skills, gathering assets. Why? It's because the adults take care of everybody. They take care of children. And then, and then we forget that being an elder is a different time of life. Being an elder is that it's the other end of the bell curve of life. You know, life mm -hmm. is not a trajectory, it's a bell curve. Yeah. And, and we go through the third stage of life we, where we are not failing adults. We are elder. Elderhood is a time not of gathering and doing. It's a time of being and thinking and sharing. And it's a time of losing skills. So let's just turn to, you know, to our elders, the same as we turn to our children and say, we're the adult. We understand. You, I need to accommodate your changing emotional needs and your changing skill sets. Okay, I can do that because I'm, a, I'm a, an adult. So I will accommodate my elders. changing. Right. Skills. And there's so much to be learned if only, I, I was just talking about this over the weekend. I mean, I really believe that we, we have a, a responsibility to to care for us our society's elders and um, and, and bridge this generational gap. Um, it, it used to be much easier, right? But because families were more um, together, and now yeah, they're more yeah. geographically separated, and so we're, I, we're really losing a lot of wisdom and knowledge are. that that could be passed down. And so maybe the elders, right? Sure, they're not they're not doing anymore, and we have to accommodate. Um, and, and change their environment, just like as you were saying, you know, we do with young children, but yeah. taking the time to have conversations with them, and because they still have so much to offer, just in sharing yeah. their experiences, and and I also feel like you know what, you would have a, a lot less uh, depression and behavioral issues if we included them mm -hmm. more. Well, you know, you've got to realize that uh, quality of life is not in the past and it's not in the future; it's in the present. And, you know, whether we're talking about somebody who's experiencing dementia or not, if, if you, um, to experience quality of life, what is that? That's beauty and companionship. Yeah. And the, the time to experience, experience what your senses are bringing to you. It mm -hmm. happens in the present, not the past, mm -hmm. not the future. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you think about the, um, the, the role or the time of elderhood. It's a time for, for putting down all that you've been doing, slowing down. Um, your skills, physical and cognitive, are going to slow down because that's what life means. We slow down and then we die. Just like when we were born, we begin to gather skills. When we are approaching the other end of life, we begin to lose skills and we slow mm -hmm. down. There's nothing terrible about that. <laughs> that is life. And, well, and so, if you want to enjoy life, you need to bring your focus back to the present. And we call this being mindful. We call this, you know, the study of mindfulness or meditation. And the really beautiful thing is that if I am losing skills, not only because I'm aging, but because I'm beginning to experience dementia, well, I'm going to lose the ability to drift into the path using my memory skills. I will lose my remembering self and I will not lose my experiential self. I remain entirely skilled and able to enjoy the present. Now I'm also losing rational thinking skills and it's rational thinking skills that allow us to enjoy the future, to anticipate, to initiate, to uh, plan, to, uh, you know, all of those activities, those are rational thinking skills. And somebody who's experiencing dementia does lose those but not the intuitive thinking skills, not the skills you need to enjoy. The, the ability to connect. Right, exactly. Now, you know, people, and I hear it all the time, I'll hear people say, you know, <laughs> yeah, my mother, she's got, she's got Alzheimer's, she has dementia. Yeah, I know, I've, I've lost her already. I've lost her to dementia. Well, let's think about that for a minute. When an infant is born, it does not speak our language. It doesn't have verbal language. But we don't say, ah, I give up, 
I'm going to have another child. This one can't speak. I've lost <laughs> this child. I can't talk to this child. It doesn't understand my language. But now when somebody who is an elder or somebody who's experiencing dementia is losing uh, verbal language and they're losing their memories, that is true. They are now living in the present, not because they choose mindfully to be living in the present, but because they must. That's what they have. That's what they are equipped for. Right, but right. That's, that's the person experiencing dementia. It's not their companion. And so what I teach people to do, and, and you know, I've, I've done this myself. You, you, you use your memory and you use your rational thinking skills on behalf of your loved I, you know, I remember going to a, to an adult family home where one of my clients had been staying and she was in the latter stages. And, and this particular day I got there and there's a new staff member, somebody who didn't know me. And I came in and, and this person says, who are you here to see? And I said, well, I'm here to see Mary. And she kind of goes, ah, well, you're wasting your time. She can't get out of bed. She can't swallow. She can't speak. She... And, and, she, and I said, well, that's okay, because I'm here to see Mary. I love Mary. And she said, well, she won't even open her eyes. And I said, that's okay. I'm here to see Mary. Now, I went and sat down. I pulled up a chair and put the chair right beside Mary's bed so that I was looking at Mary's head on the pillow. She was practically in a fetal position. She certainly looked like she had not been speaking. I, I could see she was not getting out of bed. She didn't look like she still had you know, any, any ability to communicate with the outside world at all. So I used my memory skills and I used my rational thinking skills and I sat there with her in the present and I began to talk. Mary, Mary is Judy. You know who I am? I'm your good friend, Judy. You're Mary and I'm Judy and guess where we met? Oh, let me think. I think we met eight years ago. I think it was eight years ago, you and your tomato plants, you were out in the front yard watering your <laughs> tomato plants. Oh my goodness, we had such great talks. Oh, I remember, I remember, I remember. And, and as I sat there, she didn't move, she didn't open her eyes at first. Minutes passed and I began by telling her, I didn't touch her because she doesn't know who I am. Right, right. I sat there within reach and I told her who she was and who I was. And then I started telling her her favorite memories. And I made sure that I told her who she loved, who loved her throughout her life, because I spent eight years learning her memories. And I made sure I learned them in her words with her phrase. And as I talked, all of a sudden, one eye opened. She snuck a peek at me. And then both eyes started opening. And then pretty soon she was moving. And then her hands are moving, her arms are moving, she's moving, she's giggling, she's chuckling. It brought her spirit back to life. Yeah. Just <laughs> like the same way. It works exactly the same way as if you play somebody's music, the music they love. And what happens is people who have lost all of their memory skills so that they're living in the three second psychological now, and people who have lost the ability to initiate, initiate language, remember vocabulary, all of those things due to the loss of rational thinking skills. Those people retain their intuitive thinking skills and their experiential self. They are fully present, but they need our help. And, and in the end, she puckered up to kiss. It took <laughs> about a half an hour before, you know, this to me, this is, this is, don't tell me you've lost your loved one to dementia because you haven't unless you, you you use your own skills on their behalf. You know, it, it's um, think of how it would feel to be trapped in the present with no ability to comprehend what has gone before. To scary. Know, really scary and really empty. Like imagine if you didn't know whether or not you'd lived a good life. Imagine if you, every time somebody walked into the room, you don't know if it's a complete stranger or your, your wife or your husband. Or your daughter. So why are we not doing a better job um, as a society in, in taking this approach? What what has to happen, Judy, to we, we need to a make it model. more like this? <laughs> we need a different model and we need to think about it. We're so busy doing and we're so busy accomplishing and gathering and you know and being busy, busy, busy. We don't think. And so that's that's what my message with Dawn is let's reconsider the model. This is not disease. We don't have a cure. There aren't symptoms. 
It's just us, human beings, experiencing the loss of skills and emotionally reacting. And let's recognize that we human beings have skills and we have more skills than we realize. We have rational thinking and intuitive thinking skills. And it's intuitive thinking skills. It's, it's not secondary, it's primary. We right. have a remembering self. We have an experiential self. Don't tell me that it doesn't matter because she won't remember anyways. It matters because she has now experienced it and she will have an emotional reaction to what yeah. has just yeah. happened. Right. And, and the comfort. And comfort, right. And so can we not recognize that it's, it's us, all of us are human beings. We all deserve dignity. We all deserve kindness. And just because a loved one has lost memory and rational thinking skills, and, and most people have changes to their attention skills as well, just because they've lost skills does not mean we have. And so we use our skills on their behalf. Let's, um, let's talk a little bit about the, the situations where people are getting frustrated and mm -hmm. angry with their loved ones. and. Um, and you know, I, you know, I don't, I don't mean this to to bash on these people. It's no, because no. when you're emotionally close to it, it's far more difficult than you know somebody oh, yeah. from the outside looking in. And you can tell a family member or a caregiver all day long, you you have to step into their reality now. They're no longer capable yeah. of stepping yeah. into yours. So, so right, redirect or just go along with it. Um, but yeah. what, what do you have to say to those people that are are struggling? Are yeah. struggling with the anger and the resentment of having to care with somebody with dementia. If you do not understand which skills your loved one is losing and which skills your loved one is using, not losing, you will constantly inadvertently embarrass them and frustrate them and you will end up absolutely exhausted by the conflict. The two of you will drive each other out of your minds about like by, by breakfast most days. I mean, but it's because they're not on the same page, right? Because there's yeah. been no actual oh, thinking about two, like what. Yeah, two things. Okay, so what are we talking about? What does dementia do? It takes away rational thinking skills, right? We all know that, or most of us know that. Okay, so I've lost my rational thinking skills. And um, what are those skills? Well, if you go to the neurologist, they say something about executive functions. But here, here's one of the simplest things. Um, a uh, daughter comes over and she's going to take mom to a doctor's appointment. Mom's got dementia. Daughter is, you know, she's doing her best. And she says, okay, mom, we got to get there. Got to be there on time. So um, let's see. Um, it's cold out. You know, it's January. So you're going to need that wool coat of yours. And, and when you can grab your coat, grab your purse. And mom, she kind of looks at the daughter and she says, no. Right? I mean, this is typical. Right? Yeah. What do we call that? We call that. Um, a change in personality and uh, it might develop into a combative behavior if the daughter pushes mom mom cold outside this is winter time it's january i told you get your coat you need your coat no right okay what's the daughter doing here what's mom doing what skills are being at are we asking mom to use so daughter maybe points to the window and she says mom you can see it's snowing it's cold outside you have to wear your <coughs> All right, so mom might even look, see snow, look back at the daughter and say, I've told you, I am not wearing my coat. Now, if I'm losing my rational thinking skills, I'm losing the ability to see cause and effect. So if you want me to understand by looking out the window and seeing snow, to understand that when I go outside, I will become cold, I don't have that skill. All I know is I'm standing in the living room, it's 70 degrees, I'm wearing a sweater and a turtleneck and I'm not cold. And you're telling me to put on that wool coat? No. <laughs> no, I might so not. So what would you that. suggest to the daughter to do in that situation? Don't expect your mother to use the, the, to have the ability to perceive cause and effect because we know she's losing that skill. Right. So There's just grab the jacket, grab the coat, Say, you know, wait oh, till okay. she gets cold and give it to her. Yeah, no problem, mom, but do you mind if I bring it? Because you know me, I'm always cold. No, no, honey, you go right ahead. They walk out the door and I tell you, it's gonna take three seconds. The psychological <laughs> nap, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Mom will turn to daughter and say, I'm cold. 
Oh, here you are, mom. I brought your coat. Oh, thank you, honey. Totally different interaction. What's the other thing people do? They say, mom, you know, you need your, it's cold out. Grab your coat and your purse. I'll meet you at the back door. Rational thinking. One of the skills we get through rational thinking is sequencing. If you say, do this, then do that, then do that. I can't do that. You have set me, you've set me up for embarrassment. And if the people whom I need help from the most, the ones that I think love me the most, if those people keep setting me up and embarrassing me, keep demanding that I do stuff I can't do, what's what's your reaction? Heartbreak. Heartbreak. And anger. anger. Yeah. And anger. Right. You know, the, the other thing is prioritization. We all, with no problem at all, we prioritize ideas and actions. You and me. You know, we wanted to do this to, today, so I prioritized all kinds of things to be ready on time. I, I forewent doing certain things, and, and I kept checking the clock and making sure I had time. I prioritized all morning to make this happen. Now, but if I'm experiencing dementia, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee, and you call me up and say, hey, Judy, you know, we're going to do that interview at 1 o'clock, or, you know, are you ready for that? If it's five minutes to one, and you're calling me because I haven't yet appeared, I might just look at you and say, well, I'm drinking coffee. Or I might just say, no, because I'm losing my, my vocabulary skills. I'm not being difficult. You're asking me to use skills I don't have. Now, think about what that means. Let's say, let's say I fell off my bicycle, took a bad hit to my head, and I completely lost my vision. That can happen. A TBI can result in a loss of vision. Now, I've had vision my entire life. What if my husband now, the next morning, I've lost my vision, and um, he wants me to look at something, and he says, well, Judy, come on. You know, you've been using vision skills your whole life. I'm going to turn your head in the right direction and point. There, see? I know you can see it because you always could before. That's exactly what we do when we say to our loved one, what? You don't understand why you should take a shower? Well, let me tell you why. See, really, Mom, it's because you know, you don't smell good. Your clothes have got stains on them. You didn't take a shower this morning. You haven't done it for a week. You, there's this reason, this reason, this reason, and this reason. And what we're doing is saying, use your rational thinking skills and analyze why what I'm telling you is proof that you should do what I'm telling you. you if I don't have rational thinking skills, that's no different than demanding that I use vision skills I've lost. It's just All not right. going to happen. It's not going to happen, but you know what is going to happen? I will be embarrassed, I will be irritated, and I will be frustrated, and you will get behavioral reactions from me based on how you have now made me feel through not understanding what skills I have used, have to use and those I don't have to use. Well, Judy, I almost think it's so I've seen, right, I've, I've seen all sorts of different situations, and there's the, the situations where the person does exhibit behaviors where they become... Um, combative, stubborn, yep. right? Yep. The ones that I have found to be Violent. like really sad are the ones who just like they sink into their shell yes. and you yes. they start to internalize the like there there's something wrong with me and I I right. don't know what I'm doing I can't do anything right. 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 Oh yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. You know, the other thing we have a you, we you have to touch on and I don't know why this isn't part of the initial diagnosis of dementia. People can also be experiencing anosognosia. Anosognosia, without knowledge, is just Greek. Anosognosia is the condition of being unable to perceive changes in your own physical or cognitive abilities. It will happen if something happens to that part of the brain, if you get damage to the part of the brain that gives us self-knowledge. Dementia very often affects that part of the brain. So it's not that she, your mother is in denial. It's not that your dad is difficult. It's not that you need to drag them back to the doctor and have the, you know, the, the expert tell them that they have been diagnosed with dementia. A, a large number of people, like 50% of the time, in my experience, the person who is experiencing dementia is without the ability to comprehend that they are losing cognitive skills. Now, if I can't tell, if I if there's no way for me to be able to know that there is that things are changing in my ability to make decisions or to recall information, then and you tell me, you keep telling me, 
Judy, you're losing your memory. You're making bad decisions. You're putting yourself at risk. It has to sound to me, the only way I can interpret that is that you were out to get me. You were stealing my stuff and accusing me of losing it. And you were trying to make me look bad. Now, if, if that's my, my spouse or if that's my child, I'm going to feel so, so attacked. And the yeah. result is paranoia and extreme anger. And so that is the population of people who are experiencing dementia. They, people become really violent because the world is not making sense. We need to fix the system so that way this whole thing doesn't have to be as traumatic. Like the yes. trauma of it all could really be minimized with taking yes. the approach yes. that, that you talk about. And I don't right. mean just the trauma for the person with dementia. I mean, the, the whole situation is traumatic oh, for loved ones yeah. and them. But if, yeah. yeah, but if they're taking your approach, you can really minimize the trauma. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's what it does. It, you know, I, I use a... Um, like I, I, when I'm teaching my classes, I talk about, you know, you can C over C, like an algebraic um, equation, comfort divided by co confusion. Now, we, as their companions, the environment is up to us. Whether we choose to learn about what skills they're losing or not, that's up to us. Whether we choose to use our cognitive skills on their behalf, that's up to us. If we do, we will be increasing companionship and comfort and decreasing confidence. If we don't, we are going to have conflict. There's no way around it. You will have heartache and loss and conflict and, and pain for everybody involved. But, you know, <laughs> just think about, um, so people pass away, right? People die. Yeah. So just think about how these family members or these family caregivers are feeling when that yeah. happens, when it's when it's been such a rough road. And if only if only they'd received the education and the skills and the guidance to be able to minimize the, the drama yeah. and the trauma before their yeah. loved one passes, how. I just I, I can just picture them moving forward in life without carrying guilt, you know, right. as opposed right. to the guilt, how, when guilt it's is so, oh, the guilt is just so painful. And and I hear that more often than not from families or from people who say, Oh, I wish I knew about this when my mom, when my dad, when my husband, wife was experiencing dementia. But you know, the problem is that we're just we've we've taken our eyes off of real life. It's almost the same as our, our decision or, or we're so busy and we go ahead and eat food created by corporations that is designed to survive transportation and last on a shelf. We forgot that food was meant to, to be nutritious to our bodies and to keep us healthy. Mm -hmm. And then in the, the field of our, inter, our familial relationships, we wouldn't dream of demanding that a 15 year old take naps like a two year old and and we wouldn't dream of demanding that a that a two year old you begin to go to driver's ed and learn how to drive a car. You're going to have a whole lot of pain if you don't take the children' emotional skills and development and cognitive development into account in your interactions. And mm -hmm. and and we've we've forgotten this. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. all doing it. We're all just people. Yeah. So, so Judy, um, you write and you speak about strength-based dementia care. And I'm sure that we've sort of already been talking about it, but I, I want you to get more specific about it. So so what exactly does strength-based dementia care mean? It means what, what, what we do, what we want to understand is that, number one, we do not lose all our skills to dementia. We do not become crazy. There is a pattern. The pattern is really quite simple. We lose one set of thinking skills and we keep the other. That's a strength. Intuitive thinking skills are very specific skills. And uh, it includes the ability to receive all the information from our environment via our senses. What we see, hear, smell, touch, or, or taste. It includes being able to feel our own feelings. It includes being able to read nonverbal communication from our companions regarding their feelings. And it includes also experiential learning and fight or flight. Fight or flight, that's the bad news, but those are our strengths. And then the other thing that's a tremendous strength is that we are, by the loss of our memory skills, 
the loss of irrational thinking skills, we are we are trapped in the present, fully experiential. The good news is no distraction. That's what people study meditation and they practice mindfulness to to turn off their memory skills and turn off that rational thinking voice and be mm -hmm. fully present. Why? Because in the present is where there is companionship and beauty. All the quality of life is there. That's a strength. And then um, we lose attention skills and, and we don't lose them all. We lose the ability to direct your attention, redirect your attention, maintain your attention. We don't lose the ability to focus. We don't use, lose the ability to be there. And so those are strengths. It's just like anything else in life. You need to understand what's working and what doesn't work. You need to think about people in, as, as a whole being. Not yeah, they're not lost body. yet. That's the, that's no, the thing. No, I, I feel yeah. like it gets to a certain point and basically they're just discounted and, and forgotten, right? Do you yeah. know how many? I mean, I don't have yeah. an actual statistic for you, but I just know based on experience, there are so many elders that are just aging alone in, in, alone. in sorrow and depression and isolation because people right. just think, oh, well, yeah. you know, yeah. I don't know how to yeah. talk to them anymore. They don't remember right. anything. Oh, yeah. here's a good one. Yeah. They don't remember me anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When, but you don't remember them? Is that the thing? I mean, did you lose your memory? Do you not know that's your mom, your dad, your your husband, your wife, your you know your best friend? I you know it, it's so sad for us, and I, but I think part of our problem is that for several generations now, Americans have have lived in families that were two generational parents and children, and we've lost knowledge of life has three stages we've lost knowledge of what it means to age we've become afraid of it and and we've developed through um through lack of interaction through generational isolation uh, and you know and actually social security that is not fully a good thing because it enabled our elders to not be a burden on their children and that would be those elders who lived through world war one and world war two and the great depression and so they they didn't want to be a burden on their children. But what ended up was we now have three generations who don't know elders. They've grown up with no elders. And life's not supposed to be like that. We are all of the same value. Children, uh, absolutely. adults, we and have, elders. <laughs> so. We have a comment here. Oh, Karen. Uh, so Karen Van Dyke, she's a, a fantastic uh, placement professional, Judy. So she said, I don't think I've ever had a client whose loved one had dementia who was educated on dementia. So how does one help families in this way? Where is the entry point? Makes sense when the doctor gives that diagnosis, he or she should be making an appointment with the Alzheimer's people. It starts right there. Um, make it become part of the prescription. So what she's saying yeah. is that when they receive yeah. the diagnoses that they should yeah. include in that the requirement to become educated. Yes, yes, because you know families, families come to me so broken and so exhausted and so terrified. And they say but we went to our doctor and our doctor said, "Yes, this looks like dementia. Yes, I'm diagnosing dementia." And then we went back again a few months later and said, "We need help. What have you got?" How do you help it? Like, you know, dad, mom, my my loved one's doing this, 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 and this. I need help with that. But what are doctors? Doctors are medical professionals. They're trained to diagnose and treat and cure. They're not trained to help us with experiences. They're not trained to help us, you know, as, as um, I, would, I would think maybe, I don't know, social work maybe, you know, <laughs> but we think social work is for those who are not um, fitting into society as well as they could. I think that's how we see social work in America. Um, I was just talking with a woman in, in, um, in Britain last night, and she was telling me that for a period of time there in, in, um, in England, that diagnosis of dementia took all day. And all day. If, all day. So if, you know, if, uh, if a GP thought maybe, you know, a person was experiencing dementia, then they would get sent to this day program. And they would arrive at, and at this place or a bus would take people there. And it was, you know, the, the whole day kind of. Um, and, and during the day, they would have meals and 
you know, uh, coffee time, have different activities during the day, they'd be asked to recall or, you know, remember something. And by the end of the day, the medical professionals there had a pretty good view. They had, they had had time to really evaluate and diagnose where this person's cognitive skills actually were. And then they would, then they would prescribe activities, cognitive therapy, different kinds of interactions based upon that person's um, previous life experiences, their personality, you know, how introverted or extroverted. It sounds just like the Dawn method. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's not being done anymore. And, and so, but this. So, Judy, we, so I, I know, so you've written two books and yes. two books, right? And yes. you do yes. public speaking. You had mentioned yes. consulting. So, what what sorts of opportunities are you looking for, or how how could families engage you? Or is it not only families? Is it also I don't know senior living communities and and other types yeah. of professionals? Yeah. Right, right now, if you if you Google if you Google Judy and dementia, I'm all over it. <laughs> That's me. Um, so on the Dawn web on the Dawn Method website, there is um, I give private classes, but boy, it's hard, getting harder to get me. Um, I'm always That's like good for you. <laughs> well, no, it's not because I, I it's time for me to be an elder, but I, I'm <laughs> always looking for people who want to become Dawn trainers and join me in teaching okay. this. But I teach private classes to families because dementia is, brings out a lot of private issues and it's very personal. Um, I consult with families. Then I have the home care subscription, which is 36 short videos. And we it took us a ton of software to get this available to families for a period of time because we wanted them to to just be able to buy the subscription and look at those videos whenever the issue came up. Just like, ah, I think Judy had a video on this very topic and she had some ideas. I can go look at that 10 minutes later, my memory is refreshed and I can solve this problem. <laughs> uh, that's for families. And on the Dawn, webs Dawn website, there is a lot of free material. It's all under families, free resources. There's probably okay. 50 or 60 articles in addition to interviews um, and then the subscription to home care. Then for um, professional caregivers, just this past year, 2020, um, we launched the certification program. And what we're seeing is that people who are certified in the Dawn Method as a Dawn Dementia Care Specialist are able to say, well, you know, um, I would have been making 15, 20 an hour, but now that I've got the certification, I can charge more. And, and families want it. I get calls from all over the world looking for Dawn certified caregivers in their communities. So then the next step, and we just got this out in November, is uh, providing uh, agencies and facilities a program where they can train their staff and keep their staff trained. I so was just it's thinking all that. New. <laughs> it's, you know, it was a busy year here at Dawn. For, just, it's very exciting. It <laughs> Yeah, very a very productive year, and it's it's really yeah, exciting yeah. because it's it's so needed. So if yeah, um, yeah, anybody yeah. listening, or when uh, when I go ahead and repost this as a YouTube video, how can people learn more, Judy, and, and how can they contact you? Oh, I'm um, just send an email to info at the Okay. And, or just go to the website, and it's all there. You know, you can sign up for a newsletter. You can, um, you know, just and there, there's videos that are free too. Um, okay. We're still working on the YouTube channel, but there's some up there already. Well, I'm. It was such a pleasure talking to you, and this information was was very valuable. And I know the audience will will find it valuable for you know, for their own loved ones, but also any advisors that have been listening. Um, you know, when they're when they have clients that have received a diagnosis, they can tell the families about the Dawn Method too. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for being a guest today. Oh, thank, thank you for welcome. having me. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> as a reminder, um, my name is Sarah Barker. This is Connect Our Elders. Uh, the entire intention of Connect Our Elders is to empower the aging process by providing education around elder care resources, um, helping families to navigate through those resources, and then, of course, ongoing advocacy. Uh, Judy, 
I would love to have you on again. So we'll definitely sure. talk. I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe we'll just get like very specific on some, you know, some strategies for family members when they're, when yeah. they're helping their loved ones. But um, thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. You too.